everybody. Welcome to the end of life planning session. Uh, so I, thank you. I'm so glad that we were both invited to be here. So my name is Michelle Mosia, and I'm a nurse practitioner, and I work in a senior emergency center, but I, and I also do comprehensive senior wellness visits on uh, older adult population. And I also have with me, and you can come over here and talk into the mic. Hi, I'm Tom Avery. Um, I work for St. Joseph Mercy Hospice. That's my day job. I'm also uh, a deacon in the Archdiocese of Detroit, um, so I'm, I'm kind of busy with that. Um, I work in home care and hospice, but also now in palliative care. And end of life um, planning, advanced care planning, is something that's become very near and dear to me over the last five years. Um, so I'm, I, I hesitate to say I'm always excited to talk about it because <laughs> it's on a really big topic to talk about, but um, it's really something that's important for all of us. Right, absolutely. And I see so often that working in the emergency center, so often, you know, people just, you don't just come to the ER to visit, right? You come to the emergency center because you're not feeling good, and sometimes it's a very critical event. And um, sometimes what happens, individuals come in the emergency center, and it's not going to be good news. And so we actually have to have those conversations with family members, and we want to find out, have they ever had that discussion regarding end-of-life planning? Have they determined a surrogate that can talk for them if they can't speak for them for themselves? And sometimes what happens is that people have not had that conversation. Um, certainly, I think as we age, because there's two things you can't change. Atul Gawan, who's written Being Mortal, and he's an astute Boston surgeon that took a journey and learned how he should talk to his patients about end-of-life planning. He worked with hospice nurses. He says there's two things you can't change. We can't change dying, and we can't change aging. Those are the two things that we can't change. So, and, and even though I'm talking about as we get older, we get more spiritual, we become more grounded, that we always, um, I'm always impressing upon, I have three daughters, that we've all had the conversation um, if something does happen. And in our family, we had a tragic accident where uh, my nephew's wife, her only sister, had a tragic snowmobile accident. And the snowmobile hit something, it flipped up in the air, her helmet came off, and unfortunately she landed on her head and had a severe neurological brain insult. A uh, very young woman in her early 30s had a three-year-old and a one-year-old. So not married very long, and to have that conversation where the physicians, the surgeons, and everybody's saying that it looks like, you know, Amber's not going to... Uh, Amber may not survive, and one of the things that the family wanted to know, if Amber does survive, how would her injury affect her life? And that was a tough conversation, and they deemed that if she did survive this insult, she would never know her family again. She would never be able to snowmobile. She would never be able to do things with her children and go out with her only sister that she had and celebrate birthdays. And that was very, un that was like a shock to everybody, not only that she's now had the severe brain injury, but what was the outcome going to be? So there was a the very uh, struggle because it wasn't a conversation that anybody entertained to have. And so what happened, and the, the husband's very distressed, everybody's distressed, and then her father, he remembered something. And he said, oh my goodness, I know what Amber would have wanted. And everybody was just looking at him. And he said, he said, just a few weeks ago, do you remember when we went to go see so-and-so at a nursing home? He said, Amber said to me, Dad, promise me, if anything ever happens to me, that I will never be able to do the things that I love to do, don't ever put me in a place like this. Just whatever happens, just let me go. And that's what happened. I mean, she 
gave him a gift and didn't realize, it wasn't a foreshadowing, that she knew that something was going to happen. And based on that conversation, as hard as it was, they did remove her from the breathing machine and she died peacefully. And without that conversation, I think they would have, there's no doubt, it would have been a very much struggle, what are we going to do here? Because, and that's why it's so important to have these conversations just in case something inevitable does happen. And I've talked to my children, I've talked to my husband and everything, and I've said, if anything ever happens to me and I can't do the things that I love, like Deacon and I talking about end of life planning and being a nurse and enjoying my children, I said, you are to let me go. But I did give them an out. I said to them, but if you like every single day putting makeup on me, doing my hair, putting pearls on me, and you don't mind changing my poo-poo and pee-pee diapers and all my drooling, and you girls don't mind doing that, and you don't mind either, Vic, it's okay. Because if that's what makes you happy, I'm good with that. But the day one of you says, and I looked at all my three daughters, and I know which one's going to say it, <laughs> that if she poops her pants one more time, you know, the day that one of you say that, that's the day that you say, amen, please, God, please take her. So I did give them an out for that. So one of the things I want to show you first is a really nice video called Speak Up. Do you know how to get it, Tom, for me? We're trying to, we're trying to, to work the equipment right here. We're going to show you this nice little video. And it's all done with music and words. And I'll be out of your way. So we just got to find it. It's that one. Yeah. This one right here. Yeah, right. OK.
Isn't that a beautiful video? There's so many great sentences in there. I love when it says about this is how we care for each other, right? Because really what you're doing is actually helping alleviate the stress of the individual that actually has to carry out what your wishes are. And it talks about we have to have a plan. And back in that corner over there, there's these tennis cans. If you go look back there, and they say emergency plan in the can. So if you want one of those this evening, our, our EMS knows about that right there. And what you put in that can is a copy of your advance directive, like wallet, card. Um, there's, uh, you picked up that nice just-in-case information card. You can put your medications on that, who's your emergency contact. You put it in that can and keep that in your kitchen, like by your refrigerator on top or somewhere when they walk in. Because paramedics, whenever you call them, yes, they're going to attend to your needs, but they're also going to look for something in your home, and they usually look in the kitchen, because that's where a lot of people put their medications so they don't forget to see if there's anything there that they need to bring with them. Because when you call 911, you may not be able to articulate clearly your medications, your allergies, etc. Who do they need to call because you're not feeling good? Okay, so you want to have information so they can grab that and they bring that with them to the emergency center. Okay, some of you might have file of life, you have that on your refrigerator, but you need to have something available just in case. The other thing you want to do too is maybe carry something with you in your purse or your wallet. Some vital information that you think that a health care provider might need to know if you can't articulate it. Now if you've been in a hospital system like St. Mary Mercy Hospital where I work, you've been there, we have your electronic medical record, we can go backwards and see things. But that doesn't mean you may not have been with us for five years, so how could that be up to date, right? Medications may have changed, maybe you developed an allergy, you've had a surgery be, um, during that time, your wishes might have changed, so it's very important that you have this living document and people understand what you need. So when we look at how did this evolution um, up occur, we do know that there is ethical shortcomings in end-of-life planning. And basically, just as this slide was saying, in 1950s, dying was largely a private affair. Nobody really talked about that. Nobody talked about end-of-life planning at all. That wasn't there. But it wasn't until the 1970s, the Karen Ann Quinlan case, because some of you can remember that, right? She's 21 years old, vibrant, out with her friends, having a great time, having alcohol. Unfortunately, she also took some sedatives. She had a cardiac arrest, and she died. But she was revived. But what happened, she was in a persistent vegetative state. So her father sought to remove her from the breathing machine, a ventilator, but the hospital said, absolutely not. You cannot do that. But he went to the New Jersey court. He argued that she'd never want to live that way. She was in a vegetative state. The New Jersey court allowed. They removed her from the ventilator. And as we know, she continued to breathe. And she lived for another 10 years. And then in 1983, the, the Nancy Cruzen, maybe some of you can remember that case too, she was another young woman. I believe she was in her 20s. She was the first right to die case. They believe she was the, also the catalyst that created this, this law that we have, this Patient Self-Determination Act. She was critically injured in a car accident. And her family also argued that she had spoken to them and that, she, that if she was in a persistent vegetative state, that she didn't want didn't want to, she didn't want to live either. And then the Terry Schiavo case in 1990, and remember she just died, what, maybe, what, five or ten years ago? She was the woman that had a cardiac arrest, and she had suffered 
brain damage because she didn't get enough oxygen, even though CPR was, was done. And then her husband argued and said they had a feeding tube in her. He wanted that to be removed because she was in this persistent vegetative state. But it went back and forth in court. Her parents didn't want her to stop from being tube fed. In the end, the court decided to remove her feeding tube, and she died a number of days later. But that court case went on, I think, for like eight or 10, 10 years. So from all this, is in 1990, the patient, yeah, the patient Self-Determination uh, Act. Well, maybe I have to I do it here. Drive, no, I was going to drive it for you. Okay, you drive it for me. Right. I, I had the mouse right there. You moved it. I'm sorry. Okay, right. so we'll go past That's that one. Right. Yeah. So in 1990, the Patient Self-Determination Act actually was created, and that is for um, everybody that, that, oh, there's their pictures. Sorry. Okay. Maybe you remember that. It's uh, what the state of, in the state of Michigan, it's actually called the Public Act 312 of 1990, is that when you come into a hospital, we need to ask you questions. You know, do you have an advanced directive? Have you done some advanced care planning? Do you have a surrogate that could speak for you? It's a law. We have to ask you those questions to see if you have it. It doesn't mean you have to have one. But we have to ask you if you have one, and if you don't, do you want anybody to go over how to complete a document like, like this? So the next one. So this advanced directive, you name someone that can make decisions for you about your medical care, but that only comes in place when you can no longer speak for yourself. That's it. It only comes in place when you no longer can speak for yourself. Okay, and that's determined by a physician. The next slide. So despite this federal mandate that this has to be done, there's still a gap. And you saw in that video, right, that it said 71% of people know they should do this, but only, what, 29% actually did it, right? And how many of you in this room, and you don't have to raise your hand, have actually had that at conversation and completed that document, whether it's a, uh, everybody starts laughing, ha, ha, ha. No, I'm, but the, I'm my okay, good, okay. Two and a half years ago good. before my surgery. Okay, is the five, the five wishes document or an advanced directive document. And in just in this in, in landmark study called the support study, where there was over 9,000 people enrolled, it was called the study to understand prognosis and preference for outcomes and risks of treatment. 46% of do not resuscitate orders do not resuscitate orders were written two days prior to death. That means they didn't have discussions. That, that many of these individuals may have suffered, had unnecessary care or unwanted care, but they never had that, that conversation. You can go on to the next one. 50% of all conscious patients experienced moderate to severe pain in the final days. Isn't that sad? And that's what Deacon Tom was talking about. He has the service that he's been working on, palliative care, which is symptom, man symptom management. He'll be going over that. Families report high rates of stress and psychological symptoms when they had to decide withdrawal symptoms of right-to-life choices in family members without direction. Can you imagine being asked that question and you've never had that, that conversation? So advanced care planning, it's more than completing an advanced directive. It's not just signing a piece of paper and saying somebody is going to be your surrogate to talk to you. It's learning about treatment options, what you want, what you don't want. It's about thinking about your values, what is important to you, what are your goals of care. Talking about decisions with your family members and, and your physician, because your physician needs to know too. Because many of you have probably had physicians for a number of years, and you're their family. They've adopted you. They love you. So you want to make sure you tell them what you want, because they may not want to go there. Because they have taken care of you for so many years, and you want to, to document that. And this is just to let you know. Do you know on the back of your license, there is a place where you can make an X? to say that you're carrying an emergency medical card, 
So when the paramedics pick you up, they, they can look at your license. And if you have an X there, they know there's something in your purse or your wallet that actually explains some information about you. And, you know, I didn't know that until my daughter got her license when she was 16. I was looking at her license. I go, oh, my God. And she actually came home with a pamphlet that actually talked about that, that the Secretary of State made that. That just alerts people that you have some information you're carrying. On the next one. And then also on the, on, on the Michigan website, you can actually get this little card, but you can make it yourself. You can put it in the plan of the can or put it in your wallet that you're going to have some emergency information so that someone will know what your, your wishes are. So what we're going to do right now, we're going to see from a physician's standpoint, you know, about his feelings about all of this. And this is, doc, this is actually Dr. Atul Gawan, who's done a lot of work around this subject matter. And because he realized as a surgeon he could fix anything, but he didn't realize it till he walked around with hospice nurses and palliative care that he really wasn't trying to find out what you wanted. What was your goals of care? Because he could fix anything. And he realized that maybe that's not what he's supposed to be doing. He's really supposed to be finding out what's most important to you and what do you value, right? And he needed to work his magic, his surgical hands around that to give you what you needed, not what was just to fix something. He needed to really find out and actually find. There's actually the Being Mortal video that Atul Gawand um, about his journey. It's 60 minutes. But you can actually go and see subsections of, of, the, of parts of it. And he talked about Sarah, that young woman, her eighth month of pregnancy, where she was diagnosed with lung cancer. And there's a nice little segment in there about him talking to her husband after she died. She did have her daughter, but she died shortly after that. And when he talks about he didn't want to get on that train ride all the way to the end, and what he meant by that is that she knew that she was not going to survive, and so did her husband. But unfortunately, he, he couldn't let go either, Dr. Atul Gawande. He couldn't let go either, and he actually says in one part of the video, he says, when I said to you, well, we can try this or we can try that, and he says, but he knew that that, that wouldn't work. And he said, well, basically, you lied to me. And he, and he says, you could be sued for this. And he said, yes, I did. But I was on the train ride with you. I wanted to do everything that I thought possibly could work, which I didn't, knew, I knew it wasn't going to work, but I, I stayed on this train with you. And what he talks about is that they all wish they wouldn't have done all this extra stuff. Because, because as they kept on adding this extra stuff on, she continued to suffer and where she couldn't even hold her baby anymore. And she was sick with the treatments. And he wishes that they would have just did what she wanted to do, live the best life she can for the last few weeks to be able to enjoy her, for her family. And so, and then he gives you, and he, and he talks about some other things about priorities, right? And he says in priorities shift. And we need to find out what are you willing to trade off for what you're going to get. And today was I was in the emergency center and a family, uh, somebody called and they said, could you come and talk to this family? So I wasn't taking care of patients today, and I went in and talked to them. And I just said to them that, have you ever talked about priorities with your mom, what you would want or what you wouldn't want? And what do you think would make her the happiest? And what does she like to do the, do the most? I said, I, so concentrate on those things. So when the ER doctor comes in, and talks to you about, well, we can do this, 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 and that, you need to say, well, if you do this, 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 and that, and you find out this or that, you need to say to yourself, by finding out, are you actually going to do anything about it? And then you have to find out if this is going to cause your mom some suffering, and, and do you want to go on with that plan of care? So I said, you and your sister need to start having those conversations now so you can make a better decision and remember it's 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 not about me or you it's really about your mom you know what your mom mom would want so I'm going to let now Deacon Tom take you on a journey 
uh, you have a copy of his PowerPoint right now. And then when he's done, we're going to have some conversation too. We'll go over a little bit more things in the packet. Yay, Mike and I are more used to the St. Mary's. We've got those over-the-ear ones. You look like a rock star. I don't like those. I'm, I am far from a rock star. <laughs> um, I, I could probably tell you hundreds of stories, and I don't want to because every single one of those stories is different, right? They're all those people's stories, and sometimes stories can be scary. And sometimes stories are comforting. But for all of you, your story is going to be yours. And that's what's important to remember, that when you're talking about this whole big picture of end of life, it can be scary, can't it? I mean, just those words, end of life. Um, I'm, I'm still work, working on a book. I haven't finished my silly book yet. Um, I thought that when I had 10 weeks off because of my quadruple bypass, I'd have plenty of time a year and a half ago to get it done. <laughs> yeah, no, I was a little bit more focused on something else at that time. The first thing I want to talk about, it's not on this slide, and it just came to me, you know, you don't have to have a terminal illness to got, start this process. You know, you don't have to start thinking about this when it's all down the road. It's down the road is now, right? Down the road is when we start planning. Because um, for those of us that have our Catholic faith, we say, um, why are we born? Anybody remember the, cat? I mean, the Baltimore Catechism kind of taught us. Yeah, okay. To know, love, and serve the Lord. And to be with him forever, forever in heaven. heaven. So we're going to die, right? There is no way out. You know, there's a 100% guarantee that we're going to die. I, I do, um, um, because part of what I do is teach about advanced care planning, one of the things that I talk about says, um, it slipped right through my mind. We'll come back to that. Um, it's it's part way through in the presentation. I'm t teaching ahead already. Um, so how are we going to have these conversations? What are some of the best ways, and it's not liking me, there we go. Maybe if I try behind the back. Or I can go up there and just huh. I'll do this. So a quick agenda. Why is an advanced care plan important? Who are you going to share these wishes with? What are we going to talk about? When should you have this conversation? And how are we going to maximize your effectiveness and not have so many unpleasant feelings about the darn thing? All right. Well, I'm just going to do it this way. So, you can see on your slide, these are a lot of the words that you might have heard before, right? Estate plan, will, five wishes, medical power of attorney, advanced care plan, advanced care planning, advanced directive, durable power of attorney. You could lose your breath, you know, you could think about it and say, wait a minute, it's all the same thing. You know, for those of you that have spoken with a lawyer, um, you might have a complete estate plan. Um, I managed to get that done two and a half years ago after talking to people for two and a half years about how important it was to get it done. So I didn't do it right away either, right? Is it something we like to talk about? Anybody here? No. We're not going to be happy talking about it. So all of those are words for an advanced care plan. Why is sharing it important? We heard a little bit about that. Um, What's important about it? Number one, you'll see in the slides later, this is a gift that you can give to those that are going to be following on after you. And we don't want to have these conversations, but it truly is a gift. I, the stories that I can tell are of hundreds of people, more than that, many hundreds, coming to the hospital not being able to make a decision anymore 
needing hospice care, end of life care, and the family says, I have no idea what mom or dad wants. Now you would think all of those were stories of young people, right? No, there's lots of stories of 92 year olds that come to us and families say, we never talked to dad about this. We just never thought it was gonna happen. He's 92, what's going, you know, he's just gonna keep on going. This is a sidetrack. I had a 102 year old man tell me, I asked him, listen, what kind of advice can you give me? I mean, I'm, I'm not quite, I'm a little more than half your age, but what kind of advice can you give me in my 50s as a 102 year old? And he leaned, sat back in his chair, leaned forward, and I was getting ready to take notes because he looked like he was going to give me a lot. He said, don't live to be 100. <laughs> That's really good advice. <laughs> um, these are benefits for you. This advanced care plan is for you because you have in your mind how you want this to go, don't you? You really would like this to go smoothly. Now, can you prepare for every single possible thing that's going to happen? No, absolutely not, because you don't know. But can you give enough information that can ensure that the end of your life goes as you want? Absolutely. And that's what the advanced care plan does. It doesn't specifically say that if I'm in a car accident and I have to have a leg amputated and I have to have this done, then I want this, this, and this. It's going to say a lot of general things, but it's easier to interpret by your family if you've had that conversation and by the doctors and those people that are caring for you. You are gifting a loved one or another advocate the knowledge and the authority to ensure that your wishes are respected if you become unable to communicate this on your own. We all want to think that we're going to be able to tell people, right? We all want to think that I'm going to have time. I'll let them know. They're going to know. I'm just going to be in a hospital bed and I'll give them the clue. Those are the stories that I can tell. Now, again, I don't know. But I know of way too many stories where people just didn't talk about it. Ooh. It's also important. <laughs> Does it show up? It's important. Okay. So it really is a benefit for your loved one, your advocates, your care team, so that they get it, they understand. It makes your family's decision making pretty straightforward and it provides peace of mind. Now, don't mistake this provides peace of mind because um, when I do a bigger presentation, I talk about a funeral director that came in. He said, a family, a couple came to me one day. They had seven children and they wanted to get everything in place because um, they wanted it to all be done for their kids so that you know, everything would be in place and they wouldn't be sad when we died because everything was taken care of. He said the kids came to see me the next day and they said, they said what? Do they think that we're not going to miss them? And the funeral director says, well yeah, you're still going to be sad, right? You're still going to, you know, cry about this whole thing, but everybody's going to have peace of mind. If your kids know what's happening, if they know what you want, then there's no arguing, there's no fighting, there's no questioning over, well, Joey wants to pull the plug, but Susie says, I want mom around longer, and, and so on and so forth, and don't think that that doesn't happen. That's the hardest part, is watching families have family discussions about what's going on with mom and dad. Those aren't discussions sometimes. Who are you going to talk to, right? The first thought is, yeah, I'm going to share it with my kids. Well, absolutely. You want your children to know what these decisions are. It's very important that they understand what you mean. So as you're developing these plans, you're going to talk with them. Um, my mom did hers. My dad passed away. 33 years ago, he was 49 at the time. 
About a year and a half later, mom did her advanced care plan, got everything in place, did the whole estate plan, and gave us our copies and said, here you go, please read it. Never did. Why would I? Come on, mom's going to live forever. So mom got into crisis. We're all pulling out the, <laughs> what did mom really want in these situations? So that's important that not only do we give it, but we discuss it. You're going to share your end of life wishes with those you expect may be involved in your care decision making. Important. Think carefully about the individual you're gifting with the responsibility of being your advocate with power of attorney? Do I have lots of people saying I don't want my children making these decisions for me? I do. Why might that be? Because families realize that their children might fight about it. Because they don't trust that their children are going to do exactly as they wish. Sometimes, um, I see this more often than not in single children families where you don't want that burden to be on that particular child. You want them to be more of the, um, the caregiver, less of that decision maker because that's a struggle. And caregiving is a whole other topic. So it's very important that you're thinking about who do I want to make these decisions for me? And again, important to remember what Michelle said. These plans cannot be activated unless you can't make the decision any longer. Now, sometimes it's obvious. You're lying in a bed, you're, you know, you have in, you know, kind of advanced dementia and you can't speak or do anything anymore. You can't do anything about it. The plan is in place. Sometimes there's a fine line. Two doctors have to say you can't make those decisions anymore before that plan can be activated. So it's not a clear-cut thing all the time. So again, important that you know who you're talking to. Ooh. Again, family members and loved ones might not be the ideal person. The trauma and stress of your condition might influence their ability to fulfill your wishes. I see that all the time. I work in a hospice setting um, and family comes in and says, Mom said X, and we're saying Y. I don't want to let her go yet. I don't want, I still want mom around. She's only 63. She's only 75. She's only 82. I'm not ready to let go. We still have, I mean, we've had those feelings too, right? Loved ones that we've lost. Um, it's hard to let go, right? This is, it's our humanness. It's our human nature to want to have those folks with us. Um, even if we have good faith and we know that they're going to a much better place, we still have that humanness. We want them to be close to us. Remember selecting the person you can trust and they have to be willing to implement your wishes even if they might not agree 100%. Tough decisions sometimes have to get made at end of life. Most often, spouses choose each other first and then a child. But it can also be nieces, nephews, cousins, neighbors, friends. The list is kind of endless. Um, and in Michigan, just this past year, um, and I don't have that in here, um, the state of Michigan implemented one new um, thing that you can do. So you can put all of this in place, but you can also choose someone to make funeral decisions for you. So, and that can be separate from all of these folks. You can say, I want, you know, Jimmy to do durable power of attorney, Susie to do financial power of attorney, and Sam to do my funeral plans, because I know Sam's gonna follow what exactly I want. You know, they're gonna, they're gonna do X, Y, Z, they're gonna pick the right funeral home, we're gonna work on that. So you can designate a separate person to do your funeral plans to make sure your wishes are followed. Because nowadays, as Catholics, we know we've been to funerals sometimes where we say, but that's not, but why, no. <laughs> and, and oftentimes when I do my bigger presentations, we have uh, the pastor come in and we, we talk about, you know, what's the Catholic rites? What happens in a Catholic funeral? 
and why we would do it a certain way. Another good reason to pick a funeral. We already did that. Father, we had our pastor come in and do a whole, whole hour and a half on it. Awesome. <laughs> Ignore what I just said. <laughs> An hour? <laughs> Thank you, Father. How are we going to strategically approach the conversation? How are we going to minimize awkwardness and unpleasantness? There's a couple of things in ad campaigns that are kind of cute. Um, Mom, here's a deer. We love you more than anything. Now we want to hear about your end-of-life wishes. How often does that happen? <laughs> yeah. Dad, here's the deal. You told me about everything now. Tell me about your end of life wishes. Our kids don't do that. Your son finally knows your advanced care directive, also that your nickname in college was the freak. <laughs> <laughs> TMI is good when it comes to advanced care plans. But let's face it, when family members finally reveal their true selves, sometimes we're bound to, bound to find out more than we bargained for. I mean, we love to tell stories, right? And oh, by the way, I was never going to tell you this, but my kids already know my one dark secret. Yes, I was there when we stole the big boy statue off of Jefferson Avenue. Oh, you're the one. 1979 or 1980. We had great plans. It was going to go at UAD, but anyway, the, the statute of limitations is well over. So let's talk about some tips. In marketing, there is a famous rule of seven. It takes seven impressions before somebody buys your product or service. Seven times? The reality is it's probably going to take more than one conversation with your loved ones to understand and accept and realize what you're talking about. It's usually going to take three or four conversations. And oftentimes, it's not going to be coming from your kids to you, right? you're going to be the ones that are starting to kick this off. And I want to say kick it off and not kick it down the road anymore. Um, and again, like Michelle said, I don't want to ask how many of us have it done. So here's another seven. There's seven steps in a good conversation. Um, navigating difficult discussions, because is this a really easy discussion to have with our families or with our loved ones, with our spouse? Not at all. Create the right setting. Make sure you've got time to have the conversation. Sometimes it's not a good thing when everybody's over for Thanksgiving to say, oh, by the way, can we talk about this now, guys, <laughs> when the kids are all running around? Maybe not a good time. Now, this one we're skipping because it's not important at this minute, but it's not a bad thing when we're talking with maybe others, if we're having this conversation with someone else in our family. Ask them what their understanding of their disease or their situation is. Ask yourself that. How much do I understand about what I might be going through right now, if you're going through anything? Ask yourself what your hopes, expectations, and priorities are. Now, I'm not saying make a bucket list because bucket lists are often just way too silly. But what if? What are my expectations if I have this end stage illness right now? If I'm suffering with a cancer, where do I want it to go? What are my trade-offs going to be? Find out what our goals are. Can they be accomplished? Are they realistic? If I want to go see the Grand Canyon, can I still go do that? I had a gentleman, my very first hospice patient outside of the hospital setting. I always cry when I talk about this guy because he became very near and dear to me. He was younger than me. He was 54 at the time. Pancreatic cancer. Horrible disease. I've seen too many men with it and, and women with it. He still wanted to go hang gliding one more time in the throes of this illness. So we talked about it. We went through and we said, can you get this done? You know, are you going to be able to get where you want to go and have people help you through it? So we worked out a plan. We talked to a good friend of his. We, you know, the guy brought his hang glider so he didn't have to worry about moving it. 
and he ended up, there's a video um, that he put on YouTube. He was up in the air hang gliding for three hours, soaring and enjoying his time. And I, I mean, the guy compressed that three hours into like a, a 12 minute video of his emotions, his feelings, of what was going through his mind. It's powerful to think of our goals. Let's make sure we can get them accomplished too. Make sure when we're talking to ourselves, to our loved ones, make sure we're talking empathetically, not just factually. When we're talking to our kids and having these conversations, now, Jimmy, you're going to do this because, and Sally, you're going to do this because. Respond to them because they're going to say, I don't want to talk about this now. I hear what you're saying, but can we talk about it anyway? This is important to me. This is important that I want to give this gift to you. Now shut up and listen. No. <laughs> That's not empathetic. Have a plan. Follow through. Review and revise it. Now you might put this plan on paper and tuck it away and say, well, I've got it done. I don't need to look at it for a while. Not always a good plan. Now there's no set time when you should go back and look at it. Three years, five years, ten years. If something changes, look at it again. If you get a different illness and your path is different, if you have a different, um, if something different happens in the family and somebody moves over to you know, Europe and they can't be there for all of those important decisions, go back and look at it. It's a living document when you create an advanced care plan. When we're talking with our kids, ease into it. You know, it's that, just like you've always had a good conversation, ease into it because it's going to be tough for them. Just as you've just worked through it, you've got up the nerve and the courage to talk to them. Don't throw it at them, you know, again, at Thanksgiving. Not a good time. Talk about your life and what's important to you. This is the time when you do tell stories. You tell, you know, remember this, and, and this is how I saw... Uncle Joe do something, and this is how I saw Grandma do something, and this is how I want it to be for me. Good conversations. They can naturally happen at dinners, family events, wedding celebrations. I don't know. That was in the literature. I'm not sure I want to talk about this at a wedding with somebody. Um, although I did it at my daughter's wedding, I wanted to tell my mother. <laughs> She had to embarrass me, right? I got up there and danced with my daughter, and she had to embarrass me. Even funerals. Good times to talk about it. If you're at somebody else's funeral and your kids are there with you, hey, by the way, did you see how that happened? Did you see how that happened? Me too. That's what you're going to do for me. Don't try to cover it in one sitting. Don't, don't, don't. Even if you have a list and you made this list and you're going to get to the bottom in one sitting, please don't try it. Don't assume they've absorbed everything. Remember that seven step approach? After you first break the ice and you say, I want to talk about this, I've put this advanced care plan in place, I want you to know about it. Again, set aside a quiet time to dive into the details, especially if you've got a large family. Three, four, five kids, seven, ten. Um, my gosh, I got nine grandkids. <laughs> Sorry, that just popped into my mind. I got six and three and a fourth, and I got ten. It's going to be a tough time to rehab these conversations. When you start the process, your fear and the fear of your loved one is going to go away, right? Once you start talking about something, isn't it easier? Once you broke the ice? The hardest thing is breaking it, but explaining you're giving your family a gift of peace, a peace of mind to know how you want your life to be at the end. How you don't want to be the way this person was, or you don't want to see them this way, you don't want this to happen. Please follow my wishes. Not easy, but important. Be a matter of fact, remember it's not about you dying because we're all going to die, right? We, it's not about that. It's about living and loving. 
how do you want the rest of your life to be? If you get in this situation, I want to be taken care of this way. If you get in this situation, I want it this way. It's about how you want your family to love you and how you're loving them by giving them this information about how you want to do this. Knowing your wishes is going to give peace of mind to you, right? You put this down on paper, this is how I want it, and it gives them that peace of mind so that if for some reason you're the one that has that accidental fall in the home and is all of a sudden in the emergency room with nothing in place, or so you think, because it's not there, with some, anyway, it means you've got it done. They don't have to worry about it always emphasizes about love. I love you and here's why we're talking about it. I love you and here's why we're talking about it. So, what's the most important thing to think about in all of this? What comes to the forefront are emotions, right? It's about emotions. Now I thought this would pop in maybe the picture. Yeah, there it is. Oh, it bounces in. <laughs> How are you feeling today? Right? All of these things are going to come into play at some point when you're having the discussion with yourself and with your loved ones. It's not about controlling our emotions. It's about knowing what they are and knowing how we're going to share this with our loved ones. Because there's these little ones in here. I'm exasperated. I'm exhausted. I'm scared. I'm frustrated. They pop in. Again, be direct. Encourage family to ask questions. Remind them there's no bad questions and listen to their thoughts. Because just because you're telling them that this is the way you want it, um, doesn't mean they're not going to have questions. And it's important if they want to say, but what about this? And what about that? Because some of the younger ones in our family may not like some of our decisions and they may be familiar with newer technology and all these other things and say, but don't you want to have this radiation therapy or this kind of chemotherapy and what if this comes out and what if this comes out? Good conversations. Just a couple more. Be specific when we're talking to them. Do you want cremation? Burial? Memorial service? Viewing? Church service? Other special requests? What's going to happen to your beloved pet? Some of these things come more into play if it's just us now, if it's just one person, and you don't have a spouse. So these are important things to remember. This one is very key because I, we run into this in hospice all the time. If you can no longer safely care for yourself at home, what do you wish to happen? That is so important because so many people say, I am not leaving this house. You're going to drag me out of here on a gurney. Well, it might come sooner than you like if you fall down the stairs because you can't take care of yourself. So this conversation, while you think it's not important, this is one that my mother refuses to discuss. She won't go there, and she's not safe in her own house, and she's out of money. What are we supposed to do? Tough conversations. I'm still trying. I mean, I don't have all the answers, believe me. You know, my mom belongs in a place where people can take care of her, and she has money to do that, but she refuses to leave that house. And many of you are probably in the same thing, right? I've been in this house for 45 years. You think I'm going to leave now? <laughs> Over my dead body. <laughs> okay, Mom. So, last slide. When's the most important time to start talking about it? Yesterday. <laughs> Right? Because it's never too early to have these conversations. I thought it was too early. Come on, I was 50-something <laughs> a couple, two and a half years ago. And I had this opportunity through my health plan at work, you know. Heck, you can get this all done, complete, finished. I paid for it for two and a half years and never got it done. Never got it done. And I'm talking about it with people and I'm saying... This is important. Have an advanced care plan. Know what you're going to do in case of these circumstances. <sighs> I had um, a patient ask me one time. So we're talking about this. We're putting together our goals. I I'm just curious. What does your plan look like? Pretty embarrassing to have to say. <laughs> um, well, it would look like... 
Um, and I was thankful that I actually had it done because six months later, I was in for surgery. Um, you never know what's going to happen with a quadruple bypass, right? You're expecting to come out. The outcomes are always good. But what if I wouldn't have? What if I hadn't talked to my wife about it? What if I hadn't had those conversations in my 50s? So, when is the best time? Yesterday. <laughs> Any questions about some of this? And we can have a, I know we, I, I spoke right to 8 o'clock. <laughs> Guide, yeah. Also use two for discussion too. You have a question. Yeah, I didn't read all of this so on, uh, on, on the medical hall of attorney. They can accept. They can accept. The the, the, yep. the The okay. question The question was, um, if on a medical power of attorney, do they need the original or a copy? We can We can accept a copy. And then we can scan it into the medical record once you bring it. But we do ask if you come back again, has anything changed on that document? Because it is a living document that Tom said. It can change over time. What you filled out two years ago might be something different. Um, just to give you an example, I uh, the other day when I was in the senior wellness clinic and I was interviewing a family and I always tell them to bring their documents in, and so I can look at them with the social worker. And she goes, oh, by the way, I have my document. So I opened it up, and I started reading it. And I said, do you realize that you have your husband as your spokesperson? And I just did a, a comprehensive exam on him. And she knew he had memory issues. And I know he had some cognitive impairment. And she said, oh, I'm so glad that you, she goes, I totally forgot about that. And I says, would he be able to make decisions for you? And she said, well, no. She goes, you just interviewed him. And uh, but was but as I continued to read, she had picked a second person, which was one of her sons. And then it said, if that son couldn't speak, um, be able to deliver the message that she wanted to convey what she wanted, the second son was on there. So usually they're set up that way that you pick a person, but then you pick another person. And it, it is difficult. I'll just give you a personal uh, what happened to me. So my uh, my parents, and it's not uncommon, my friends, and I have other relatives that have picked me to be their spokesperson, their advocate. You know, you're the nurse, you talk about this all the time. And I'm going to tell you right now, I kind of wish that they didn't pick me now because I've agreed. And because of the personal journey I had with my father, when as my father continued to get ill and everybody was leaning on me, I knew what my father wanted. So when it was coming down to the very end, um, I was talking to my father and I did not want to let him go. And I was persistent on some things like, no, we can try this, we can do this and that. And I'll never forget my dad stared at me and he got very angry. And he said to me, I trusted you. And it was like he slapped me across the face. What was he saying to me? I told you, you are the nurse and look what you're doing. I know I'm dying. And you can't do what you promised to do. It was really hard on me. I felt like I just like, and I started crying. And I think the hard, I think it was difficult because I didn't want to let him go. But I also needed to find out a very important answer to a question that I didn't realize until that moment when I said, have I been a good daughter? Because that was my thing. I didn't realize it. That why I couldn't let go because I didn't know. And it wasn't, a, and when he said, yes, you have, then I said, then I'm okay. I can do what you, what you want. I'm not going to suggest things. 
you know, because I could suggest all day long, you know, I'm in the health care, you know, I could do this or do that. Just like Atul Gawande said, he didn't want to go on that train ride all the way to the end, but he kept on suggesting things, even though he knew it wasn't going to be right. It would only end up with suffering for that. Yes. They can, I'm really unfortunate, they can actually, okay, so you come into the hospital and your uh, family knows what your wishes are and you don't want any of these things, but, and you have a living will and you've had it signed and documented, you've got the two witnesses, it's, it's what it's supposed to look like, and, and one of somebody your children say no 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 I we know what our dad wanted but we're not gonna go that road we want all this stuff they can do that they yes they can they can that's why they tell you but that's why they tell you you always want to pick somebody that you know that can speak for you so it may not be your children just like Tom was saying because it's very difficult for them so sometimes they pick, like I'm some, some of my friend's advocate. They picked me, not their children, because they said they don't want their children to be able to have to do this. In that case, if you had designated someone as an advocate and uh, some of the other children said, no, we don't want to do that, mm -hmm. the advocate says, that's what he wanted or she wanted. Yes. And that's what we're going to do. They can't. Okay. Correct. So the, the other question is, is that the advocate knows your wishes, you have siblings, the advocate says, no, I know what dad wanted, he told me I'm on this document and I'm going to do it, and the, and the two siblings are arguing, the two siblings are arguing, it doesn't matter because you're on that, you're on that document, okay? And that, but it is, it, it still will be a problem because even though I knew what my mom and dad wanted, there was still discord in our family among the other siblings because there was a couple siblings that were very upset that I was making the decision and I kept on saying, I'm not making the decision. Mom or dad made this decision. I'm honoring and they question it. But how do they know and how do you know and it's not fair and blah, blah, blah. So it did, it still can happen. And we see it in the emergency center sometimes too. Now EMS, what EMS will do, and, uh, and um, we couldn't have EMS here today, but when we do our program, we have a three-week series, we have EMS come in too to talk to you about what they're faced with if they walk in your house and, and somebody's saying, no, dad doesn't want this or blah, 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 but there's other people that are in there that are arguing, EMS won't get into it. They won't get into it. They're just going to scoop you up and bring you to the emergency center. They don't have to. They don't have time to deal with family conflict. So if not everybody's on the same page, I didn't know that until they came and helped us with their program. I had no idea. They said if there's a bunch of stuff going on, we're just saying, hey, you called 911. We're going. You come to the emergency center and you can talk about it. Talk about it there. So even though sometimes you think it's it's. It, we're all going to be on the same page and you think every all the siblings are sitting together and you're around talking about it it's still it's it's still hard you know just like I said when I spoke to my three daughters right and so and just living through it it's going to be hard and we hope people will honor our wishes what we want but they can't honor your you can't even have that chance of honoring your wishes if you haven't even talked about it right yeah. It's better to have it there because it's a document that you come to when you're in the hospital that actually shows that you had the conversation and it's this document. That's why it's encouraged for you to have it. It takes away this grayness on it and it gives us 
as practitioners that 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 legal stand you know that you have this this document there that you've had this conversation we can do it without the document usually the next of kin can talk to us and say they've had that conversation but the document is great because it holds a lot of weight too with it any other question that some people had as you're listening us talking well one one there's a goals of care questionnaire here and it actually helps you walk through situations where you may never have thought about like the first one says circle how much you fear the the falling near the end of life do you fear being in pain how much losing the ability to think being a financial burden on loved ones losing control over my medical care how much do you fear at the end of life losing ability to practice my faith it's an exercise to go through, and this is, it can also help conversations with your family. Number two, is it more important for you to have your wishes followed at the end of life, even if your family members or friends disagree? Is it important for you to have family and friends all agree on decisions, even if different from how you would decide? Is it important for you to, I'm uncertain. So these are, these are good conversations uh, starters. Here are things about end of life care that some people believe, indicate if you agree. If a dying person can't get enough nutrition by mouth, a feeding tube should always be used if it will keep the person alive. Anybody want to have a discussion about that? Yes. Yes and no. Okay, repeat the question. Yeah. Is, is an, sorry. Is it an extraordinary measure to have a feeding tube? Have, has, did Father talk about some of the ethics issues at all in the Catholic Church? He talked about the planning. The planning and the funeral. Okay. So there are two, three, four different ways to look at feeding tubes. And a lot depends on how you want this to be. Number one, if you, um, if you look at Catholic Church teachings, if you look at John Paul II and his teachings, nutrition and hydration are things that we have a right to. The corollary to that is, yes, we have a right to a feeding tube, we have a right to hydration, as long as they are providing benefit. Because at some point in time, our bodies no longer use that food um, I've journeyed with a lot of people in the dying stages now. Um, I've seen far too many numbers pass away, you know, on hospice with me. And, and it's a sacred time. It's a wonderful journey. And some people stayed on a feeding tube to a point. And at some point, our bodies no longer utilize what's going in, and it becomes more harm than good. So you're sticking a tube into the stomach. I don't want to describe how, I mean... I've watched the procedure. I don't want it done <laughs> unless I really need it. Um, but food goes in and it's not going anywhere because your body doesn't have a need for it. God created this magnificent human structure and when it doesn't need food anymore, it says, no thank you, I'm not hungry. And so if you're still pumping it in, it might not be going anywhere. So sometimes those things are hurtful. Sometimes hydration is hurtful. That's where the medical community can help step in and say, yeah, now's that time. Now's the time when that's not going to be good anymore. So there is that fine line. At what point is it beneficial and needed? And at what point is it no longer necessary or helpful? Am I causing more harm than good? And in the teachings of John Paul, we're pretty clear. If we're causing more harm than good, then it's okay to step back. It's, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a great, it's a great question because, as Tom was saying, that if you're taking in nourishment but your gut's not moving anymore to push, 
push it forward, what's going to happen? If it's not going forward, you're going to be pumping things in, and what are you going to have? You're going to have a stomach ache. You're going to have a abdominal that's going to distend. You're going to get cramps. You could also have diarrhea. So the, the, the benefit of the nutrition is really not beneficial because you're not utilizing it. And also, they, they do know that individuals with advanced dementia, advanced dementia, these are adv individuals that have advanced dementia so much, so far advanced, meaning that they can no longer do anything for themselves. They can't speak anymore. They're having difficulty swallowing. That is an individual you, you do not want to think about putting a feeding tube in because they are ending, they're nearing their end of end of life and to have those con conversations. Sometimes feeding tubes are good if it's a temporary measure, right? You're, you're recovering from a surgery. You can't eat or drink anything by mouth. You might need that nourishment. Let's say you've had a stroke and your swallowing mechanism was, was uh, affected. But over time, you're going to get that back, right? So you might need a feeding tube at that time to pull you through recovery until you can work with speech therapy, work to learn how to swallow again. So there is advantages to having a feeding tube too. But again, it's having that conversation, right? To make sure that it's beneficial and it's not harmful. You were going to ask a question. Right. Correct. Correct. Pardon me. Right. Well. Correct. Correct, when there's hope for recovery. Exactly. And then another question was, once a treatment is started to keep someone alive, it's sometimes okay to decide to stop and withdraw when the person's quality of life is very low. So that is something to discuss, too. What does that mean? Is it is once, a, once treatment is started, when the person's quality of life is very low, what does that mean? That's individualized, right? What do we mean by quality of life is very low? You know, there might be an individual that you see maybe in a wheelchair, they can never go out of their house and all they do is watch TV. Does that mean their quality of life is low? Maybe not for them, right? They're fine with, they're fine with that, right? Being able to sit by the TV, watching TV shows, they're okay with that. So that's a question you have to define. What do we mean by quality of life is very low. That's individualized. It's usually better for a dying person to be, to be given good comfort care at home than to be admitted to a hospital for intensive care. Again, that's something to think about too, right? Do they need ICU, right? And is the ICU intensive care unit going to be beneficial for them? Or is it going to cause them more harm than good? And it's better to bring them home and give them that quality if they're not going to survive that. And that's conversations we also have in the emergency center when we're talking to um, families, too, is, again, it's what's the priorities? What's the goals of care? What do you want for mom or dad? We can put them in the hospital, and this is what's going to happen. Or you can take them home, and we can provide home care, right? Get people to come in the house. Maybe mom or dad or family member is towards their end of the life. We call on hospice services to, to come in and provide that service at home because that's a benefit you don't have to pay for, right? You don't have to pay for hospice services. That's a given benefit we all have, right? It's a Medicare benefit. Woohoo! That that we can have that. So that's something to think about. And we we have we'll call on St. Joe Mercy Hospice to come in or palliative care team to come in and talk to family members to give them options. Don't we all want options, right? You want to lay it out there. You know, what, what, do, what do you want? 
Number four, you are very sick and the doctors cannot stop the disease. With all possible treatments, you might live for another few weeks. During that time, you would be on a breathing machine. You would drift in and out of consciousness. Without these treatments, you would die in a few days. Would you want the breathing machine and other treatments? Another heavy question, right? I mean, like Tom was saying during this whole conversation, you can't prepare for everything, right? You need to talk to your family what's most important to you, what your priorities are, because you're never going to be, be able to cover every certain situation. But, but they should know what you value. Right. And, and this, one, this one is more a real-life situation than not. This is something that happens far more times than I would like to see um, in, in this. And, and people have a really hard decision to make if they haven't talked about this, you know, because there's always that concept of pulling the plug. Um, and, and if I start this, how do I stop this? If I put my loved one on this breathing machine, it'll breathe for them forever. It will. You'll see their lungs go in and out, um, but you can still die on a breathing machine. Um, I'm not trying to be morbid about anything, but I'm just saying that that can happen. That sometimes we, you know, we, we think, well, the, the breathing machine will keep them going, keep them going, and, and we'll have them with us, but they can still die even though their lungs are going in and out. So I, I, I'll just take a quick sidetrack um, because I'm also from hospice. Have you guys had a hospice conversation yet? Does anybody have any, I mean, I know, Hospice can, she, she kind of brought up the topic. It's a free thing. Um, <laughs> does anybody want a, a five minute talk about hospice? Do you know the difference between hospice and palliative care? Because you've heard the terms, right? So why don't you do that, Tom? Okay. So I'll, what's I'll the difference between hospice and palliative care? Okay. <laughs> so, wow, I got myself into this one, didn't I? Palliative care and I draw a very simple chart. It's not, it's not hard to, to see this. If you draw a T and you look on this left side, we call it restorative care, right? It's where we're all at right now. We want to get better. We want to get physical therapy. We want to get treatment. We want chemo. We want respiratory treatments, you know, uh, dialysis. All of these things are to help us get better. Right on the very edge of palliative, on, on that restorative care is something called palliative care. A lot of different reasons that you can seek palliative care and more and more organizations are working on something called palliative care in the home. Um, palliative, uh, the word palliative comes from French, although the English don't like to admit that because if you watched, um, anybody watched, um, oh, what was that English, um, Downton Abbey. They talked yeah. about palliative care in Downton Abbey. Well, that was kind of hospice back then. But pallier is the French word. It means to cover with a blanket. So in palliative care, you're seeing a terminal illness, but you're not ready to stop radiation or chemo. But you're having a lot of other side effects like pain, nausea, vomiting, constipation, all of those things that come with not end-of-life care, but stuff that's going on while you're still getting treatment. Palliative care can do a number of things. Number one, it can help remind you about setting up an advanced care plan. Number two, it can help provide comfort in the home. So it's sort of like home care plus. Anybody had home care? They've come home from the hospital. They got a nurse coming out for maybe wound care in the home. So there's that kind of stuff in the home. So palliative says, I still want treatments. I still want restorative care. I still want to get better. I, and I need some comfort along the way. It's also very common to have a palliative care team evaluate you in a hospital setting if you're having um, a lot of pain in the hospital for a whole bunch of different reasons. You get to the other side of the T, and you're in something called comfort care. Now, comfort care doesn't mean you're dying tomorrow. If I were to bet, if I ask you what the word hospice meant to many of you, you'd say, it's time for me to go get my sympathy cards out because so-and-so is going to die in three or four days, right? Hospice care means I'm gone. I'm out of here. That's a tough way to look at this because what are we talking about with advanced care plan? Having the best 
quality of life for whatever time is left. Is it two weeks, two months, two years? We don't know. We have two patients on hospice right now. Um, our doctor always says, you know, at some point you're going to have to bail me out because they've been on hospice for two years and that's not normal. But some it, people actually graduate. Some people here. graduate. We had a lovely 101-year-old lady, came on hospice, we thought for sure, within just a couple weeks she was gone. 101 and a half she graduated because she got better. Okay, she went outside and was starting to garden again and cooking her own meals. I don't know God's plans and we can't ever plan on it. She came back at 102 and graduated at 102 and a half. She came back at 103 and made it to 103 and a half. So we don't know, you can graduate from hospice. It's not something that is, you know, always a defined plan. Normally, when we talk about palliative care and hospice, the doctors are asking sort of the surprise question. The surprise question for palliative care, would you be surprised if this patient wouldn't be here in a year? That's a palliative care question. The surprise question in hospice is, would you be surprised if this patient wasn't here in six months? Now again, they're doctors. They don't know everything. The important thing for you to remember is if you're making that decision, you're making a decision to spend more time with your family, you want comfort, you'd rather be around as many family and friends as you can, preferably at home, but there's a whole bunch of statistics around that that I won't go into. But hospice allows you to stay at home. You don't have to go back and forth to the hospital anymore. I can't tell you how many times we sit with people in the emergency room and family says, okay, mom, let's go home now. And, you know, we're just going to go get this treatment and blah, blah, blah. And mom says, this is the 10th time this year I've been in the hospital. Isn't that enough? I'm done, I'm tired. And we all kind of know those things. The question is, when is that time? We don't, I mean, that's going to be up to you. Talk to your doctor about it. They're going to know, they're going to recommend it to you. But in two minutes or less, because I made it too long, hospice is a Medicare benefit, like Michelle mentioned. It comes from your Part A. It covers any equipment that you would ever need in your home. Bed, wheelchair, walker, oxygen, all, all of those things are covered. It'll cover your medications. It'll cover a team of people that are going to come into your home. You'll have a doctor, a nurse case manager, one to three times a week, a social worker, a spiritual care person, volunteers. They might have music therapy or pet therapy. And then there's a team for you as a family afterwards called the bereavement team. So... Again, if I took a survey and said, what do you think of hospice? A lot of you might say, it's a four-letter word, right? All they do is give them morphine and they die. Ah, boy, I see a lot of heads nodding there. <laughs> and I just don't like the feeling of it. It's a tough decision. I get that. Because it's part of our end-of-life decisions. Um, do we give morphine? Yeah. If What's you need it. If you need it. Do we, do we walk in the door, you sign up Monday, we come in Tuesday and say, now here's this morphine, you're going to take it 12 times a day. No, what if you don't need it? Why, why would you take it? There's no need to take something that you don't need. Now, might they go through your list of medications and say, well, they're choosing comfort care. Maybe they don't need um, all these vitamins anymore. Maybe they're not interested in taking a cholesterol medication. Maybe some things might not be good. Because guess what? More times than not, what does a medication have? Side effects. Sometimes the side effects are good. You know, they lower your blood pressure and all those things. But sometimes the side effects aren't so good. I can, you know, th there's more than enough times where families come to us and say, oh my gosh, we took them off their medications and now we don't think they need them on hospice. They shouldn't be on hospice anymore. They've gotten better. They woke up, they're more alert. And it's not because we gave them morphine. <laughs> yeah, go ahead.
Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's like heaven to have somebody come in there. Everybody says they're going to do things or they can't do things. But if hospice says this is what they're going to do, that is what they're doing. They're wonderful. Maybe Thank you. Here, yeah. That's it. it. It takes a certain kind of heart to be in hospice. I didn't think I had it, believe me. So I'm going to try and capture that whole thing in a nutshell. What we just heard was a phenomenal compliment for hospice. Someone who had their loved one, her husband at home for six months, had a very difficult, very difficult disease. Parkinson's in itself is hard, and then with any other complications with it, it's, it's so hard on a family. And her husband was in her living room. She was allowed to be his wife instead of his regular caregiver. Now, you hired some extra caregivers, right? That's what it sounds like. So she hired some extra caregivers that hospice doesn't pay for, but it allowed her to be her. Hospice came in, cared for him, did all the things that we say we do, and allowed for him to be peaceful and allowed for her to be peaceful. Did I sum that up pretty good? That's beautiful, Tom. <laughs> Just beautiful. I loved it because he said hospice gave I'm also lying. her. Hospice also. I love what Tom said too, and what you said that hospice also gave you the gift to be the wife, right? It took that stressor off you that there was other people there to help you. And I want to ask you a question. Do you think? that he would have survived that long if you didn't have that support? Would you have been able to bring him home? Okay. Right, as the disease progresses. Mm-hmm. Yes, yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. so, the, so the answer to the question was that if she wouldn't have had that support, that hospice care service, that her husband might have ended up maybe in assisted living or a skilled, skilled facility. And with that support, he was able to live the rest and his life out because he was in the hospital and he, all he could utter was ohm, ohm, letting her know that all I want to do is go home. And she was able to provide that so he could die at home where he wanted to be. Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. The question is, we have someone that would be interested in volunteering for hospice. Absolutely, we, and I, I didn't put volunteers in there, I, and, and it's very difficult because um, our volunteers in hospice are phenomenal people that have had either an impact on 
in their own lives or their heart says, this is some place I can help. Um, every hospice program, there's 60 some in Southeast Michigan, has training for their volunteers, which is similar to the introductory training that every hospice team member gets. So there's typically between 20 and 30 hours of training that a volunteer will go through. How do I respond in these circumstances? What if the family asks me this? What am I allowed to do? Do I do windows? <laughs> I was just seeing everybody was awake, yeah. Um, hospice volunteers are phenomenal because they can come into a home, they can go into a nursing home, they can go wherever their, their loved one is. They can go and play chess, checkers, card games, um, read to them if they're no longer able to, or they can just sit there and be a presence. And if you're in your home and your family has all said, oh, I'm going to be there Tuesdays at 2, and you're planning on going out somewhere, and you can't go out, a hospice volunteer, now their heart, you can't get them right away, but you may switch over and say, well, let me have this hospice volunteer come and sit with um, my loved one for a couple hours. Now, they can't give them medicine, and they can't do anything with that, but they can be there. They know what numbers to call. They know what to do in an emergency so that you as a loved one can go out, grab a bite to eat, go grocery shopping, um, or sit in the other room and just relax. So yeah, hospice volunteers are a phenomenal group of people that have that same kind of heart. Some hospice volunteers don't want to go into people's homes and don't want to go into facilities, but they will sit in the office and put books together for us. They will do mailings for us because there's so much behind the scenes um, that needs to get done and, and volunteers are a core part. Um, they're part of our interdisciplinary team. So that's what I got about volunteers. <laughs> Thank that's you. Wonderful. Thank you for asking that question. And it made me think of, and then we'll close the session unless someone else has another question. But we have a program at our hospital called No One Dies Alone. And there's 80 plus volunteers that actually come in and sit with individuals that have no one that are actually dying and they're in the and they're in the room with them so we do have that so if your heart is telling you i would like to volunteer sometime whether it's for hospice or this program no one dies alone you know please you know seek out that so that you can give somebody the gift of you know we never want somebody to die alone do we uh, we always want somebody to be there. So, any other thoughts, comments? Well, we hope this was helpful and everything. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Very thank much. you. Thank you. And there's a plan in the can back.